Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin today with an update on Oklahoma's wheat crop after some pretty cold temperatures in late March. Jeff Edwards, our small grains extension specialist, joins us now. And Jeff, let's just kind of get a picture of how extensive the freeze damage has been. It is fairly extensive, especially uh, throughout southwestern Oklahoma. The hardest, hits air, hardest hit areas would be Apache, Chattanooga, on over to Altus and I've gotten some reports from northern Texas and it seems that the injury extends on into Texas down to the Gainesville area and in that area of the state we're looking at anywhere from 50 to 80 percent injury on our wheat crop in terms of freeze injury. As you move north and, and east of there it tends to decline a little bit. In the Chickasha area most of what I saw was around 10 to 30 percent injury and then north of I-40 we really didn't have much injury at all. It would be less than less than 10% in that area. Okay, and is now the time to check a couple weeks after the, the freezing temperatures? You need about seven to 10 days after a freeze event to really be able to get a good handle on the injury. Uh, and especially with the cold weather that we had, it's taken a little while, but it's, it's now where you can go out there and, and effectively evaluate the amount of injury that you have. And what you're going to want to look for with the wheat plants is you're going to need to split them open try and find the developing grain head and here is this plant and the grain head should be kind of a nice green color uh, there in the center uh, it's actively growing looks nice and green and healthy and it's green at the base now if we want to compare that to an injured plant whenever we split the stem open the grain head if we can find it at all is going to be very very small and it really hasn't progressed any after the freeze event. There's the developing grain head. Right there, you can't really even find it. It won't come loose from the uh, leaves that surround it. It's white, milky color. The growing point is a very white and it'll even turn brown now. And this plant was totally wiped out by the freeze. Uh, as far as what's going to happen with this plant, that that grain head will not go ahead and push through the top of the plant. Uh, so it's a, it's a complete loss. It's really not going to accumulate uh, very much additional tonnage as far as maybe cutting it for a hay crop or something. Uh, so in wheat that size, probably grazing would be the better option at this stage if it is a complete loss. Okay, other concerns you have uh, for growers right now that you're talking about? Well, we are starting to see some powdery mildew out there. Uh, we have some disease present. And the thing about foliar disease is that you can't really wait until it's out there to control it. Our fungicides that we have for foliar disease are things that need to be used in a preventative fashion. And if you're planning to spray a foliar fungicide, that window is approaching. You're going to need to spray after the flag leaf is fully extended, uh, but before the crop is fully headed. You're on label with most fungicides up until about growth stage 10.5, which is 50% headed. So that's your window. And that's going to be coming fairly quickly in the state of Oklahoma. Okay, good advice. Jeff Edwards, our small grains extension specialist. Thank you. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet weather report. Here we are in April reeling from another blast of winter cold. A picture taken near Blanchard Wednesday morning says it all. Plants along a roadside fence were coated in ice. This was a common sight in western Oklahoma Wednesday. A map of minimum air temperatures from Wednesday shows the extent of the cold west and north of a line from Walters to Norman to Stillwater to Ponca City. Mangum had a low of 27. Woodward bottomed out at 23. The lowest of the lows was Boys City at 14 degrees. Wheat growers are now looking at their second round of cold damage to this year's wheat crop from cold Wednesday and Thursday mornings. What really set our plants up for cold damage were the high temperatures Tuesday afternoon. Tipton came in at 86 degrees and most mesonet locations had highs near 80. Colder air had already kept Tuesday's highs in the panhandle in the mid-60s. 
adding the impact of strong winds to the cold temperatures produced a map of wind chill for Wednesday morning that ranged from a maximum of 77 in the southeast to a minus one in Boise City. What a range of wind chill for an April day. Gary, how have our recent rains helped us out? Good morning, everybody. I hope you survived the recent cold snap. At least it brought us some precipitation, though, so more drought relief. Now, last week I did promise you a brand new, much better looking drought monitor map thanks to last week's rainfall event, so let's take a look at that. Now you can see the impact last week's rainfall did have on the current map. We still have much of western Oklahoma covered by that extreme to exceptional drought, but at least from central Oklahoma out through much of eastern Oklahoma, we now have moderate drought, uh, even to abnormally dry conditions, that yellow area. That uh, means that we're coming out of drought in those areas and not in drought anymore. So great news for the eastern half of Oklahoma and the rest of the state that's gotten rainfall. Now this week's rainfall event, and ice event really for much of western Oklahoma, will be reflected on next week's drought monitor map. So maybe another good map uh, to show next week as well. Let's take a look at those totals from the Oklahoma Mesonet. We can see a good one to three inches across the eastern two-thirds of the state. Still a bit sparse out there in western Oklahoma, so we have to hope they get another system shortly. Now as we look over the last two events uh, for much of April, we can see a two-storm total of about three to six inches for much of central and eastern Oklahoma. Right there in central Oklahoma over into east central Oklahoma, we have some pretty good totals of three to even as much as uh, six inches indicated by radar. So great uh, drought-reducing rainfall events for the month of April. So for April, we've had some great rainfalls. We still need those to spread farther to the west to provide drought relief in those areas. And the cold weather certainly didn't help as Al indicated. So let's hope for some good weather ahead. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Finally today, we take you to Ottawa County and our visit to JM Mushrooms. Chances are you've bought and eaten JM Mushrooms before. They're an Oklahoma staple. So today we're taking you through their facility outside Miami, Oklahoma in Ottawa County. I never dreamt that we'd, it would get this big. I, and without the boys' help, I would not have done that. Not, I wouldn't have expanded this, this much. Virgil Jurgensmeyer is one of the founders of JM Farms. He still comes to work, but now his sons handle the day-to-day -day business. But he took a moment to speak with us about what made his company so successful. It's really more than one person can say grace over. Uh, with with uh, 500 employees around and, and um, 22 management team people uh, just to keep everything in the right step takes a lot of a lot of effort. Miami, Oklahoma has been a good uh, community for us, and uh, they have been very cooperative with us. Um, they put up with us sometimes as we were, as we were learning to compost in, in all different kinds of weather condition. And good mushrooms start with good compost. So that's where we start the tour. My guide, Curtis Jurgensmeyer, CEO of JM Mushrooms. This is a, what we call our compost yard. Uh, it's where we start making the soil that the mushrooms will grow in. Will grow in. Um, it's a 22 to 23 day process out here. We use uh, wheat straw, chicken litter, cottonseed meal, gypsum, urea, blended together to, to make our compost. So that's sort of the recipe that you come up with that creates the ideal soil for right. the mushrooms for, to grow in? Right, mushrooms have uh, they're a fungus, they have no digestive system of their own, so they have to, their food source is already broken down basically for them and that's what we're, we're doing is we're making a very select uh, food source that the, that the mushroom can feed off of. Okay, and then your crews come out and load this up and take it inside? We'll, we'll, yes, we'll do. Uh, every day we fill a crop every day. Uh, we'll bring it up here and use our fill line over here and fill it into one of these wooden trays 
and take it in to be pasteurized and okay. go through our phase two process. Okay, let's go take a look at phase okay. two. So Curtis, this is phase two. Tell us what goes on here. This is our phase two room. This is our pasteurization room. After we fill the trays outside and bring them in here, they'll come in here and they'll be in here for eight days. On about the third day, we heat the trays up to about, the compost in the trays up to 150 degrees for about two hours. And what that does is it kills anything, uh, any molds, any weeds, anything that's from outside that you don't want growing, growing in with the mushroom. So that when we plant the mushrooms, all we're gonna have growing in our compost is the, is the mushroom culture itself. So that takes, it takes uh, eight days. On the third day is when we heat it up and then we spend the rest of that time kind of slowly uh, cooling the trays back down to get them to about uh, 80, 80 to 90 degrees before we take them out uh, and spawn. This is our spawn line. What the, what the, what's happening right now is that we're dumping the, the compost that's been pasteurized out and we'll, we're adding spawn and some supplement, which is like a fertilizer to it. We're adding some water, mixing that material all back up and putting it back into the tray. Uh, this, what the spawn is, is a mushroom culture that's grown on a food source. It can be it can be uh, a grain, rye grain, a millet grain, and that's mixed in with the compost. The reason you use the culture is so that you get the exact same mushrooms every day. Uh, if you went back to the spore, you would get different mushrooms genetically. This is genetically, the mushrooms are all identical. After we uh, spawn the trays, off the line out there. We bring them into a room like this where we control the temperature and the humidity and it stays in here for 15 days. And during that time, the spawn grows off of the grain onto the compost, which is its food source, and the root system develops. The mycelium grows all through the compost and starts absorbing nutrition. And you can see the, you can see the, the root structure there, the mycelium, the white cobwebby uh, material and if you even smell it at this time, it, it actually has a mushroom smell at this point in time, so. So Curtis, this is the next step? Uh, yes, this is what's called a setback room. This is where we put the trays after they've finished the spawn room. We bring them out, we run them down a line again, and we add about a two inch layer of peat moss and limestone to the top surface of the, each tray. We bring them in a room like this. It's called, we call, again, called a setback room. And if you can tell right now, the air in here, it's really kind of stuffy. It's, um, the CO2 level in here is pretty high. And what that's given off by the mycelium growing. What we will do in, tomorrow in this room is we will call, what's called a flush. And we will significantly lower the air temperature. We'll bring it off. 100% fresh air and drive that CO2 level down, um, back down to normal. And what that does is it causes the mycelium to form what's called pins, and that's when the mushroom starts, will start growing from those pins. If we left it like this, again, it wouldn't grow a, mu a mushroom, but what you're doing is it's, the mushroom is sensing um, mother nature and thinking it's being smothered out, so it's gonna create fruiting bodies to create spores, which will perpetuate the species. It is after this step that we begin to see mushrooms emerge. What we have in here is the, the cremini mushroom, the brown mushroom. The, it's a cousin to the white mushroom. Uh, it's a little uh, more flavorful. I think the flavor is a little stronger. Uh, the product tends to be a little denser and heavier and that gives it the stronger flavor. You see the mushrooms coming up. A mushroom will will double in size every 24 hours. So this mushroom today would be that size tomorrow and then that size the next day. So that they grow very rapidly at this point in time. Uh, we'll come in here and harvest them. They're all picked by hand. They'll pick them. They cut the, 
the stem off and uh, um, sort them by size, the pickers do. At this point, we move from the farm to the facility where the mushrooms are processed and sorted. Our guide for this part of the tour, Pat Jurgensmeyer, the president of JM Farms. So Pat, obviously a lot going on in here. Describe it for us, what, what do we see? It's a very busy, very congested area actually. Um, the product that we handle over here is anything that we have that's value added, um, that's gonna be further packaged meaning it's going to be overwrapped, it's going to go to the retail store. We do all of our slicing of product over here, um, whether it goes into a 5-pound, 10-pound box going to the restaurant as sliced product, or the 8-ounce or the 16-ounce container going to the grocery store shelf. So um, all of that product is, is brought over here. We think of this more not as a farm like we do at JM Farms. This is a food processing company here. Food safety, critical deliver the kind of product you want to deliver. Talk about some of the things, the precautions you take in here and how things are set up from a strategy point of view. Well, with the, with the push in, the, in food safety, we've gone to the Global Food Safety Initiative, or GFSI. Back in Stillwater, we ask Jason Young from the Robert M. Kerr Food and Agricultural Products Center here at OSU to explain GFSI. The Global Food Safety Initiative is a private industry program. It's not a government program, it's not regulations, but it's criteria developed by uh, many retail organizations coming together saying, hey, you know, one of the primary um, concerns we have is with manufacturers sending us product that's not safe. And so they got together and they put together this umbrella set of guidance that said, you know what, as a manufacturer, to produce food and to distribute it through our retail organization. Um, we want you to meet food safety criteria set up for international and worldwide standards. Jason works with manufacturers across the state to prepare them for the audit involved with the program. When the actual auditor comes in and he sees that they're working with an outside party a resource, uh, the Robert M. Kerr Food and Ag Products Center, he sees that somebody is coming in to work with them that has this background, this knowledge on auditing for food safety and quality management. Our challenge is we want to stay ahead of the standards. We want the standards to chase us. We don't want to chase the standards. So we always try to implement something that's tougher than what's required of us right now. Okay. For example, you have some stickers on here. Explain this. We have, this is part of our traceability program where there's two different stickers on each container that's harvested. One. Um, is what we call a picker sticker. I can determine from that sticker who actually harvested this product and at what facility it was harvested at. The other sticker is a room sticker. It begins with an R. I can tell not only, um, again, who harvested it, um, but what facility it came from, what room it came out of, and once we record that data into the database, it basically looks like a grocery store checkout lane. Then I can tell, um, we can trace that all the way back even to the point we can tie it in with our growing systems. So I can tell where the straw came from to produce that crop. So we can, with a tremendous amount of information, um, we go through mock recalls. I can tell you who the final um, quality inspector was on this box. Um, just about anything you could ask, I could tell you about that specific piece of, uh, or that specific box. Back in the processing area, Pat explains more about food safety. We do a lot of, uh, of employee training with hand washing, um, follow up on what to touch, what not to touch, um, all the slicers, we have metal detectors in case a blade gets chipped, the product goes through a metal detector. We constantly sanitize, and every time we have an opportunity, we stop those slicers, sanitize the blades, we're really looking um, in for any type of contamination risk that we could put into it. The goal is to do a risk assessment on each part of the um, process, determine where we have a potential, and eliminate the potential. And it's every day of the year? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, there's somebody at these facilities. So. Um, we harvest every day, we plant a new crop every day, we take a crop out of the system every day, and we ship every day. So Christmas time, come visit us. So I had to say we're going to be here. So, And what a process it is, from compost to harvest and then off to the store. Anyone else getting a little hungry?
Late April and certainly throughout the month of May are typical calf working times for those uh, herds that have spring calving operations. And whether they're large or small, it's important that uh, those ranchers, as they're working their calves, do what we call the proper techniques for beef quality assurance. We want to do our part to make sure that the beef we send to the consumer is a healthy, wholesome product. One of the key things that we want to really pay attention to at calf working time is the proper way to inject those calves with the immunizations that we're going to give. Most of the calves, of course, will receive black leg shots. Many, in some of the operations, will also receive uh, in injections for the respiratory diseases, IBR and BVD. Whichever it is, make sure that you read the label very, very carefully and then follow those instructions to the letter. If it says that the uh, injection can be given either IM, which is intermuscular, or subcutaneous, which is just under the skin, I'd recommend you always choose the sub-Q because there will be less damage to the muscle tissue that uh, that calf will carry on to harvest time later in his life. If we're to give the uh, injection intermuscularly, be certain to put the injection in the neck area of that calf rather than back on the, the hip or the lower leg, which might be more tempting, but those are high price cuts and we can certainly do some damage to that potential beef carcass. Putting the injection in the neck area then will be a situation that will not reduce the carcass value in any place along the food chain. If we give that choice again of IM or subcutaneous, like we said, let's go ahead and use the subcutaneous. And remember to use the tinning technique where you pull the skin uh, away from the muscle of the calf and then inject into that, that empty area underneath the skin. And that way, of course, we'll do even less damage in terms of potential muscle that could be used for food later on. Follow those, those techniques very, very closely. And if you'd like more information about the, the proper way to give calves injections and handling them here at calf working time, I'd suggest you go to the SUNUP website and we'll put a link up there to the Oklahoma Beef Quality Assurance Manual. And you can download that and give you a tremendous amount of information about how you can do a really good job of handling your calves and cows to make sure that we do our part in sending a wholesome food product to the consumer. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow-Calf Corner. Kim Anderson, our grain marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, let's start off looking at the weather and the news of freeze damage and how that impacted the markets. Well, I think uh, we did have some freeze damage. You know, Jeff Edwards talked about the damage a couple of weeks ago, and we had some additional damage this last week. But I think this is a case of moisture trumping the freeze. We're going to lose some yields uh, because of the freeze. That you know, so there was talk of as you get up into Kansas, it not being as mature as it was last year, and that's good. But we got moisture in critical areas for the hard red winter wheat up through north central Oklahoma, up through central Kansas. And I think the market looked at that and says the increased yield because of that moisture is going to be more than the lost yields from the freeze. Okay, we also got some new supply and demand numbers released this week. How did those figures play into the markets? Well, I think they were mostly neutral. You can look at uh, the wheat. Uh, the market was expecting 731 million bushels ending stocks. That's right there where it came in. Now, they did miss the world ending stocks. They uh, underestimated it. They were expecting uh, 6.55 billion bushels that came in at 6.7. You look at corn. Uh, corn ending stocks came in less than expected at 757 million bushels compared to 824 expectations. World corn ending stocks, though, were slightly higher at 4.93 billion bushels, and soybeans came in right at both U.S. and world expectations. So what we had there was you know, neutral wheat, negative to neutral at uh, the corn, and the soybeans neutral. Okay, what else is going on in the market? Well, if you look uh, around the market, and you can go back to that uh, supply and demand report, uh, they increased the exports for Australia, the European Union, the former Soviet Union. Uh, we've got financial problems and economic problems in uh, Egypt, and they may have trouble, uh, they're one of the largest importers, may have trouble uh, shipping to Egypt in the future. Okay, and then what are price expectations? 
Well, now that's going, that's a, we're in a weather market. It's, it's highly variable. I've got the uh, June 20 price for uh, 2013 in central Oklahoma at $6.75 a bushel. Okay. Thank you very much, Kim. We'll see you next week. And now we want to introduce you to this year's DASNER Champions. The Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at OSU recognizes its champions at a luncheon every spring. One of the highest honors the division can bestow, the award goes to those who've worked tirelessly to enhance programs that are vital to the university's land-grant mission. This year's champions are Bob Hamilton from the Nature Conservancy and Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in Osage County, Dave McLaughlin, co-founder of Advanced Food Company in Enid, and Linda Shackelford, founding co-owner of TLC Florist and Greenhouses. If I don't do it or if I don't show the example, other people might not do it. And there were people there to help me when I needed help when I was in school. And so, yeah, you need to do it. Everybody needs to do something. It may not be for the university, but everybody needs to get back. The folks we get to work with, the wildlife and range guys uh, here at Oklahoma State, uh, are fun people to be around, but very enthusiastic. Uh, very committed to conservation and out-of-the-box thinkers, and, and that's what we need is to come up with creative ideas and bold ideas to preserve our natural heritage, and, and Oklahoma State University does that. From all of us at SUNUP, congratulations again to this year's DASNER Champions. That does it for us this week. Remember, you can see our stories anytime at sunup.okstate.edu. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm Lyndall Stout, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.